Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Energy 808, cutting edge. And today the ed edge cuts in Bang Prabang, which is uh, what, the capital or a big city in uh, Laos. And that's where Marco Mangelsdorf is, learning about energy and life and the world and Southeast Asia. Hi, Marco. So nice to talk to you at great distance this way. Well, indeed. And uh, Sub ID from Luang Prabang, which is a a town of about 50,000, remarkably uh, close in population to my hometown of Hilo, uh, right along the Mekong River in northern Laos before the Mekong continues its its epic journey all the way down past Saigon and into the uh, Mekong River Delta, emptying off into the East Sea. So uh, great pleasure to be with you. Yes, but why? Why are you there? It sounds pretty remote to me. Uh... Let me say it again. Luang Prabang, did I get that right? Luang with an L. Luang Prabang, which translates from the Lao language into Big Buddha. Uh huh. Okay. So why? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, two reasons. The biggest one being, you know, I was a big fan. I am a big fan of one Anthony Bourdain. You, you've heard of Anthony. God, I am also uh, a big fan soul, of right? Anthony Bourdain. Yes. And you know what? You remind yeah. me of him, actually, Marco. <laughs> well, uh, that's putting me in an incredible August uh, <laughs> company, my friend Jay. I really appreciate that. And uh, and you know, he was someone who, uh, to me, was was living his dream and living very authentically. And he did a couple of pieces on uh, Laos. One most recently back in 2016, I believe it was. And I was so captivated by it. And he visited Luang Prabang along with uh, the capital, I believe, Vientiane. And I was so taken by it, I just was drawn to come and see here uh, myself. So Bourdain was a big part of that. And uh, in uh, Barack Obama's last year in his presidency, he visited a number of countries in this region, including Vietnam. And, and Laos. He was the first president, in fact, to ever visit Laos. And he visited Luang Prabang with his entourage, went on a tour, met with some of the locals, had a, had a fresh coconut uh, uh, water ready for him by one of the street vendors. And uh, I thought, well, if it's good enough for Tony Bourdain and good enough for Barack Obama, then I'm sure Luang Prabang would be good enough for me. So those are the immediate reasons that drew me here. Uh, the reason I've come now again for a longer period is I am researching a new university course that I am uh, seeking to put together, looking at energy security, politics, and the environment along the Mekong, uh, which is uh, proving to be an incredibly rich undertaking and, and very, very uh, interesting. So that's a long answer to your short question. Okay, great. But let me, let me go a step further and ask, what have you learned about the Mekong? What have you learned about energy? What are the profundities oh. that have presented to you, that have been presented to you? Oh, gosh, how many hours do we have, Jay? I, I'd say <laughs> you know, I'm visiting all five, all five countries in, the, in what's called the sub-Mekong or the lower Mekong region, which is Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. I'll be going to Myanmar in a few days for a handful of days, meeting people there. Uh, what I'm learning so far, I'm focusing on Laos, uh, first, and that is that the importance of the Mekong uh, to the people of this country, both in terms of uh, power production, because there are many dams uh, in the works uh, that will go either on the Mekong or on uh, tributary rivers feeding into the Mekong. And these dams uh, are allowing, so far, allows to be a, a producer of surplus power uh, uh, which it sells to its neighbors, principally Vietnam and Thailand, with some going to China, that allows Laos to use uh, exported hydropower to be its principal source of, uh, of export earnings. So they are a landlocked country. They do not have oil. They do not have nat gas. They do not have, um, they have timber uh, and some minerals, but in terms of uh, uh, commodities that they're able to sell to, to their neighbors or to the world market. They're rather limited, but hydro is one of those uh, exportable, so to speak, exportable value 
values that they have. And uh, the challenge is building hydro plants and not essentially destroying uh, communities by having to relocate them, which they're already doing, in fact, uh, but also the fact that hydro dams, these are not run of the river, these are, these are dam dams. Uh, hydro dams have a significant impact, can have a significant impact on those uh, millions and millions, and I'm talking 60 million people who whose sustenance and livelihood depend on the Mekong, whether it's fishing, uh, the consumption of protein, and, and their overall uh, lifestyle for, for generations has been built around the Mekong. So I'd say the number one takeaway is that this river, being one of the great rivers of the world, is, is truly alive, and, and yet it is being threatened by drought, threatened by dams, threatened by politics uh, between the countries that share the Mekong, you know, as it starts its epic journey in the high altitudes of southern China and then continues over 2,000 miles, like I said, and emptying into the East Sea off of Vietnam. Well, let's let's talk about some of those. Let's drill down on some of that. Uh, La Laos is landlocked, you said. And my, my recollection is that Laos has um, probably um, the lowest population in the area. I mean, Vietnam has a substantial population. Uh, Thailand has a substantial population. Maybe Cambodia, not so much, but Laos is only, what, what, less than 10 million, am I right? Good guess, my friend. It's about seven, seven million. Seven million. That's not a lot of people. And and then you wonder, you know, with an economy that, that came from, you know, an undeveloped country, how they could afford to build dams um, along the river. And, and the answer to me, I would guess, is that China and the One Belt, One Road program has helped them do that. China has financed and engineered those dams. Am I right? You're close, Jay. You're close. It's not just the Chinese. It's also the Thais because they use or consume a fair amount of uh, Lao hydropower energy and more and more so uh, the Vietnamese. And I just read recently in the local press here that Vietnam is projecting the strong possibility of power shortages this year. And, you know, Vietnam, FYI, they are a population of last year was about 96 million, 96 million. They have a, a, a very robust population growth. They're the largest in the region, followed by Thailand, which is close to 70. So, again, not just the Chinese, but the, the Thais have, have ink deals for hydro. The Vietnamese have as well. So... That's where a lot of the politics, corruption play in, in terms of who, who's getting paid off to approve these projects mm. and what's going to be the, uh, the benefit sharing of, of these projects that are in, in many instances largely financed by countries or companies outside of Laos. So, you know, for decades to come, there will be a shared revenue stream between uh, two or more countries for these hydro projects, and uh, you know what what kind of leverage does 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 Laos have? Because it is one of the poor countries in the region. In fact, I read that more people are under the poverty line here than any other state in the region, except except for Myanmar. Myanmar is the is is the has the highest percentage of people in poverty. But uh, another unfortunate distinction is Laos is the worst when it comes to child mortality children dying under the age of five they are the have oh, the highest uh, child mortality well, that, so that must lead to uh, health care in Jay. general then health care must be at a lower standard than the, their neighbors no well poverty alleviation which of course you know addresses health care of course uh, for, especially for for younger people poverty alleviation is a very high priority of the 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 monopoly in control communist party here which is been the single party in control since the uh, the path that Lao succeeded in in, uh, in co beating the Americans back in '75, which is quite the bad year for us, you know, in retrospect, in terms mm -hmm. of South like Vietnam falling to to the north and so forth. So, yeah, it, it's a very high priority here, and there is a tremendous amount of money. I don't have a gross figure for you, but the European nations, the Swiss, the Swedes, the French, amongst others, the Germans. The Japanese, uh, to some extent, the Americans, continue to pump uh, 
hundreds of millions of dollars of, of grant and aid, essentially development money into this country. Their, Interesting. their so presence is very clear. You know, one thing that's raised by all this discussion is uh, how well they can negotiate on their own behalf. I mean, if they have control of the Mekong as it flows through Laos, then uh, they, they should be able to um, negotiate good power purchase agreements with uh, everyone who has the benefit of the, of the, uh, the hydropower. But is that so? Are they are they sophisticated in that regard? Are they do they see their bargaining position? Do they bargain for uh, you know good results economically? Well, I mean, one good result is that the electrification of the country is in the high nineties. Uh, contrast that with let's say uh, both Cambodia and Myanmar have somewhere uh, somewhere under between thirty five to forty percent of people in both those countries do not have access to grid electricity. So one of the benefits certainly to, to the people of Laos has been a high degree of electrification. Electricity here is not super cheap, nor is it super expensive, but you know, you're talking about a per capita GDP here last year of about 2,400 bucks. Okay, that comes out of $200 or so per month. I mean, you have people working in restaurants here, people coming in from the, the outlying provinces and rural area who are making a hundred some odd bucks a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to your question, to what extent, who has the leverage in the relationship here? Uh, is it equal or is it imbalanced? And my impression so far is that these foreign companies, Thai, Chinese, Vietnamese are, are doing quite well. Uh, doing these projects. And in fact, uh, a colleague of mine who I met in Vientiane uh, just this past week noted that from his perspective, uh, the, the money is made by the developers even prior to throwing the switch and creating power and selling that power. It's made through, through financing. It's made through uh, perhaps less than shady kickbacks uh, along the way. So again, to your question, I, I think it is an open question as to what extent uh, Laos has uh, has the same amount of leverage over its negotiating partner than the other party does. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, it's like Africa. It's you know, if you have the resources, uh, there there are a number of people who always want to exploit the resources, and if you don't have a strong government uh, with you know with strong officials who can you know negotiate with people. Uh, then you wind up being at the wrong end of the exploitation. How how is the government doing in Laos? What is what kind of a government is it, and how does it function? How well does it function, and where is it going? Well, there are five countries in the world, Jay, that have uh, monopoly control, ruling communist parties. One, People's Republic of China, Cuba, Democratic Republic of uh, People's uh, Democratic Republic of North Korea, DPRK, uh, Vietnam, that's four, and Laos. So only five countries in the world are ruled by a dominant control or monopoly control communist parties, and Laos is one of them. The Communist Party has been in power here since 1975, 45 years. There is no political competition. You know, my overall vibe is that it, it's not repressive obviously repressive per se, but both the people in the media and also folks who are politically inclined uh, practice a degree, a degree of self-censorship, which is not uncommon in this country, self-censorship in terms of lines you don't cross and, and things you stay away from. There is no discussion in the press about free and fair elections in this country. That is not likely to happen anytime in the foreseeable future. Uh, but this com the, the, from what I can tell, the, the Communist Party here is pragmatic and they, they do seek to improve the conditions of its people and are focused on poverty alleviation, are open to accepting uh, money from, from Western developed countries and, and the Japanese as well, and see, see the path ahead uh, as in improving their economic state and bringing more investment money into the country, whether it's from hydro projects or, you know, FYI, tourism went up 14% last year, 14%, uh, which if you do the math, uh, and if that continues, that's gonna lead to a doubling of tourists coming here in five years. So 
There are some who believe that that will be a good thing because tourism will spread money across the economy or so it goes. Uh, but then again, you and I both know that, you know, in our beautiful state of Hawaii, uh, being so dependent, the economy being so dependent on tourism is not all, all, all passion fruit and mm -hmm. pineapples <laughs> and, uh, and papayas in the morning, right? Well, you know, that, that takes me to a subject we really absolutely need to discuss. And that's the coronavirus, which is shaking the whole world up right now on a daily basis. In fact, uh, you know, news, news is on a 24 hour cycle. Um, and there are places you can find right now how many people have died, how many people are infected, what countries, how many people in, you know, in, in every country in the world, uh, global maps, if you will. And, um, you know, certainly uh, that affects travel. It affects the notion of travel. It certainly uh, supports your, your point uh, that you know, travel um, um, makes you vulnerable to the vagaries of tourism and the like. So how, how, is, um, how is tourism and how is it being affected by uh, the news about coronavirus? As far as I know, there's not uh, a single case yet that's been diagnosed in terms of the coronavirus here in this country. Uh, that said, uh, I, I, just in the past hours, uh, I think the list of countries that are, that are effectively seeking to evacuate their nationals from Wuhan, which is the epicenter there, includes the Americans, the Japanese, the Thais, the British, the French, and you know when, when other countries see see these countries like us and, and others who are who are taking their evacuating their citizens i got to believe there's going to be you know a larger stampede for the door uh there there are no shortage of tourists uh or chinese tourists here in laos uh here in luang prabang it's been the chinese uh, uh lunar new year over the past handful of days and and there are plenty of suvs that have these blue chinese license plates uh i'm seeing you know, no shortage of people walking around in, in masks, but nothing to the extent of what you see in, in other parts of the world or China, where virtually everybody's wearing a mask. So I, I think there's a fair amount of trepidation. I mean, the, the ability for, if, if there were to be, uh, probably not if, but when there are cases diagnosed in Vientiane or Luang Prabang or Savannah Ket or other parts of, of Laos, you know, will there be folks will the medical personnel have these hazmat uh, bio suits to be able to put on day in day out uh you know the further out you get from the so-called modern technology the less uh less ability that the local health infrastructure has most likely to deal with a type of uh of of threat like this uh so yeah it's, it's kind of scary i'm supposed to be back on my way back in March for a week in Shanghai, my beloved Shanghai, but I'm, uh, you know, for good reason, giving that serious reconsideration, depending on how things play out. I mean, if I can't go to Shanghai Disney, I mean, what's life about, right? <laughs> well, it's closed right now, so <laughs> cut that no. one out of your trip. Um, so, but, but the, you know, the problem is that you travel around, you have to go through an airport, and different countries will have um, different reactions uh, to coronavirus and uh, different ways of isolating it and so uh who knows what what things will be like in march uh, e either um, well in uh i guess in laos you want to think about that but also returning to the united states and stopping anywhere along the way in hong kong or taiwan or korea wherever your plane will stop uh there'll be issues in travel in general don't you think marcus well thermal scanners seem to be the rage these days jay at, at airports and uh uh, the airport here in Luang Prabang, which was uh, built not too long ago by, by the Chinese, Chinese investment money, uh, I would be shocked to pieces if there were uh, any scanners, thermal scanners in that restaurant. I don't even know if they have them at the main airport uh, in Vientiane, the capital. So, you know, I don't know, he probably developed or traveled a fair amount in the developing world. I mean, it's a different ballgame in terms of... Uh, leaving and, and, and entering the country when it comes to scrutiny and, and devices like that. So, um, well, it's, of course, yeah. it's dynamic and it's, and it's going to change. I mean, right now there's a shortage of masks and gowns in China. 
uh, and, the, and the Chinese government here to tell is uh, trying to find contractors who can build them and sell them right away. In fact, the Chinese government is building a couple of hospitals from the ground up uh, with an expectation of completion in, in a week or less. <clears throat> uh, you know, and the Chinese can do that. But query, can the Chinese, Chinese uh, effectively stop the, the contagion? That's, that's not clear. But if there's a shortage of, um, you know, masks and gowns and who knows what else you need to treat a population that's been infected, uh, in China, uh, there's going to be the same shortage or worse in all the countries in Southeast Asia. They, they don't have the manufacturing capability that China has. And, th and that takes me to, um, you know, a question about how, how close is Laos to China? Is it contiguous? Can you drive your blue license plate car right over the border? Um, is it, is it, a, is it a, a shared border or do you have to go through some other country to get to Laos? Well, you can indeed, Jay. There is uh, the northern uh, boundary of Laos, but up against the southern boundary of the People's Republic of, of China. And there is a, um, a railway that's been under construction for several years that's supposed to open at the end of next year that would connect Kunming, which is the capital of Yunnan province, southern Yunnan province, uh, with Vientiane. And this is a very big deal, will be a very big deal, because it will allow for uh, both goods, uh, finished goods from China to come into Laos, uh, as well as people over time. So, yeah, they, they share a border, and uh, the, the, these, these folks in Yunnan, more and more of them like to come and, uh, and spend time here. They buy villas along the river, and there's more and more of a Chinese presence. And you know, I mentioned that the tourism went up 14% last year overall, here and it went up 26 percent uh, for Chinese nationals. So you do the math for 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 26 percent, and that will double in about three years. Uh, uh, doubling of, of Chinese coming into Laos. Mm. So uh, you know the, this the small country, limited resources uh, that is dependent uh, or kind of smushed between um, bigger countries that have a lot more uh, resources and a lot more leverage. Uh, in, in many of these negotiations. So, uh, you know, they, they've got their work cut out for them to, to not effectively kind of be carved up or carved uh, out of, um, of their neighbors who, uh, who have a lot more uh, in their bank accounts, so to speak, than, than the, the, the party and the government and, and businesses have here. Yeah, that, well, that's likely to have the same effect uh, as it has in Hawaii, where you have um, you know, uh, richer people coming down and using your place or maybe abusing it as a, as a sort of getaway place and buying expensive properties and spending money and the like, um, that, that may have a, you know, a negative effect on the way, on the way Laos works over time. I guess it would be of some concern. Is there any pushback on having all those Chinese come up? And it must be some, some people are probably happy that, that China closed the border. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they would like rest from all the, all the onslaught, no? There is, um, I want to be careful here, but there is certainly kind of an undercurrent of antipathy amongst many of the locals towards towards the Chinese for, for a number of reasons. I mean, there's kind of a uh, feeling of resignation that the Chinese do bring money and they do bring investment uh, and that's needed. But at the same time, there is, uh, uh, like I said, so, somewhat of an antipathy towards uh, towards the uh, the deep pocket of Chinese, and it's not just in Laos, but uh, in Vietnam as well. Uh, you know, they fought a, a border war in 1979 that killed people on both sides, and there's a disputes over the, what the Chinese call the South China Sea and the so-called Nine Dash Line what the Vietnamese mm. call their EC. Mm. So it was kind of interesting is the different relationships that these ruling communist parties have. The relationship between the Lao Communist Party and, and Beijing is very close. The relationship between the, the uh, de facto Communist Party in Hanoi and, and, uh, and Beijing is decidedly a lot more tepid and, and more um, uh, kind of fraught. The relationship between uh, the nationalist monopoly control party in Cambodia of Hun Sen has been there for decades is also very close. So 
whereas the relationship between the the military back government in Thailand in Beijing is more wary. So that's why the, the the region J is just so fascinating in terms of the the different dynamics at play, the different uh, the different ethnicities, the different issues they're challenging that they're that they're uh, negotiating over, sometimes fighting over, and you know, uh, as I've been talking about for decades, energy is is being one of the main drivers of our society of economies around the world. More and more, energy is is a focal point uh, that that has my interest and will continue to have my interest. Mm. Well, let me ask you one more geopolitical question. I think we've t- talked about this before. <laughs> so you have you have a couple of processes working, and and uh, you know, one could prevail, maybe the other would prevail. One is that China would have more and more influence throughout Southeast Asia, um, you know, economically uh, and in terms of development, the One Belt, One Road projects and all that. And the other, the other process is that uh, Southeast Asia begins to uh, come together and be a region that's somehow united geographically and maybe, although the cultures are different, maybe by some common denominator in the cultures, uh, some wish to come together and be a, you know, a region that works together. And so you have two competing you know, directions, as I see it anyway. And as we discussed before, I'm always interested in knowing whether you think, uh, and especially on this trip, uh, Southeast Asia will come together and be more than just a loose confederation. It'll become uh, you know, like, a, like an EU but well, EU is a little trouble right now, but like an EU type of group, which we have special trading arrangements, special economic connections, uh, special travel. Uh, is this possible? Will it ever become um, kind of closer than it is now? My friend, Jay, that is a subject for a graduate level seminar discussion that uh, I cannot address adequately in in, in a soundbite, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, there are both cross-boundary cleavages that push the countries apart and also reasons for them to work together. My focus, uh, both kind of symbolically and tangibly, is to look at the Mekong River uh, as, a, as a way or as a, a focus of attention and where the parties, the five Mekong country, sub-Mekong countries, have to communicate, have to get along, have to negotiate in good faith, uh, the, 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 the life and well-being and the fate of this river where you have 60 million people, at least 60 million people who, de- who depend on this river for their sustenance and their livelihood. So I, I'm seeing yeah. this play out in real time in terms it's, it's of It's a common denominator. The river, the Mekong is a common denominator. And uh, this, is, this show is called Marco uh, on, on the Mekong, on the marvelous, uh, majestic Mekong, if you will. Um, and I think uh, you, you've touched on something in the sense that energy brings people together, it brings economies together, and maybe somehow uh, Laos is more important than only 7 million people. Laos uh, at the headwaters of the Mekong, uh, maybe as time goes by, Laos will play a role in that. Anyway, we're out of time, so I have to leave you now, but I look forward to our next discussion two weeks hence. Right, Marco? Indeed, and we will speak, uh, when we speak next, I will be in the capital of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, a.k.a. Hanoi. I can hardly wait, no kidding. Thank you, Marco. This has really been enlightening, as always. Aloha. Thank you very much. Take care.